Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to Table Talk with Brenda Perryman right here on TV33, WHTR.com. And Henry Tyler says we're hot. We have a lot of hot topics for you today. But before we start, let me introduce my panel. Hello, all. I'm Robert Thomas, former defense engineer, law student, and appointee for the Board of Zoning Appeals. Chris Sumrall, Detroit firefighter for over 10 years um, and co-founder of the Kinetic Group. And I'm Ken Coleman, a media and political consultant. Well, guys, before we get into the news of the day and the week, because this was the week that was, we're going to have Ken read us from, our, uh, from his book on this day in African American life in Detroit. What happened on this day? Well, it'd be my pleasure, Brenda, on this day in 1932, uh, Governor Wilbur Bruckner declares it Eddie Tolan Day in the state of Michigan. Who was Eddie Tolan? Mm -hmm. Eddie Tolan was an African American who had graduated from Cass Technical High School and had been attending the University of Michigan. And in the 1932 Olympic Games, Eddie Tolan won two gold medals really? uh, in, in, in sprinting, both in the 100 and the 200. And so uh, several weeks after the 1932 Games, uh, uh, Governor Bruckner of Michigan declared it Eddie Tolan Day throughout the state. Eddie Tolan, 1932. Yeah. African American. I mean, you got to remember that was a time when African Americans, uh, you know, for someone to be, for it to be a, a statewide day in your honor and be an African American in 1932, uh, even here in Michigan was was a was a huge deal. And so that happened on this day in 1932. Also, Brenda, and I know you know a little bit about this one. I know a little bit about it, too. On this day in 1966, Brenda, what was the top song? It was a Motown song, but what was the nation's top song? And on, on this day? On this day in 1966. It wasn't What Becomes of the Broken Hearted. Nope. It was my, was it my girl? No, it was the Supremes' is You Can't Hurry Love. You can't hurry love. No, you, you just, just have, have to wait. wait. <laughs> well, that was a very significant that year yeah. in my life. What <laughs> Becomes of the Broken Heart, it was my signature And that was song. Jimmy Ruffin, right? I, yes, Jimmy Ruffin. I was only 12. No, <laughs> I think I was uh, 10. Well, maybe I was 9. But anyway, <laughs> that was that. Thank you, Ken. Yep. I always love Motown news, too. Absolutely. And today we're going to start with our international <laughs> news. It, and it is that the Senate has approved some of what Barack Obama, President Barack Obama wants as far as um, Syria is concerned. And also, sarin traces was found, was found in the Syria, Syria's chemical weapons attack. And that compound can kill. And I don't know, a lot of people seem to be against the United States do, having military action over in Syria. But the president says, no boots on the ground. But is that possible? Gentlemen, how do you feel about the Syrian conflict? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, it's their conflict. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the president, as I think we probably all are on most issues. Uh, I do, however, Brenda and, and guys, I want to go slow on this. Uh, I would advise the president, and he's, he's already started in this, in, this, in this vein, to be sure, and, and getting congressional support and making sure that Americans are together to the extent that you can be on, on an issue like this. Because there's always going to be people that say go in and there are always going to be people that say don't go. I, I want to make sure that we've got the best information that a strike is a strike. It just seems to me, um, Robert, that oftentimes a strike might mean, you know, that's, that's what it means in the beginning, but sooner or later there's boots on the ground and you're into a conflict. Uh, you know, uh, what the Senate approved, uh, well, the Senate committee approved, was a 90-day strike on Syria. Um, and it's, no, it's, no, it's not going to be any boots on the ground. There's just missiles being struck at key targeted areas, yeah. period, point blank. Um, now it's uh, incumbent upon the Congress to go ahead and uh, approve of this action. And I, I, I say go in slow, but there's evidence of uh, uh, um, gas and chemical weapons being used. I think we do need to take action. Um, and uh, as you all know, I am a defense guy. Uh, I, I think that that's an unstabilized region. We can ill afford for that area to get even more unstabilized. 
Um, I know we went in on Iraq uh, prematurely, but this one is a little bit more controlled. The Congress has a little bit more uh, input at this uh, on this action, and I think we should go in and um, um, target key areas so that it won't get too out of control. Well, well for for the sake of argu argument's sake, I think that you know uh, it's it's good to be cautious and really look at the root reason. We know that um, the accusations of chemical uh, warfare or weapons being used is, is terrible, but we also know that the Middle, Middle East is the cash cow of the world. Mm -hmm. And so it, we w it would behoove us all, I believe, to, to really look at um, the, the implications as far as oil production, um, fluctuation in markets and things like that to see really are we be being told the truth from the beginning? Because there have been times before where we, where we were giving a story, oh, this atrocity has happened only to find out later on down the road after uh, these um, strikes have taken place, which keep in mind, if you're, if you're a, a fan of human rights worldwide, there's going to be it, innocent lives lost in Syria as well when these strikes happen. So precautionary measures, you know, I think, you know, uh, you know are, are, are a good place to start. Well, you know, Britain voted it down. Britain, who is our ally, voted down. They would not let their prime minister send boot, uh, anything over there. I think the world is war weary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't disagree. Uh, in fact, I do agree, uh, Brenda, to be sure. Yeah, but, but the other part of it is uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia um, is a big backer um, uh, uh, of, of, Syria. Uh, of Syria. And so we've got to worry about the, you know, the sort of balance of geographic uh, uh, power in a geographic sense. Uh, I still say go a little slow, uh, get the cer certainly get the authorization from Congress, but even after the authorization, I think there needs to be well, to make sure that we, we we're doing the right thing. I, I would add that uh, the UK backed out of that prematurely, though. Um, they didn't know about the chemical weapons being um, 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 poured on uh, innocent civilians that were, they, that actually died from that. So yeah, you said it's a human rights uh, issue, there's folks over there dying today, you know, thousands dying already because of these uh, chemical weapons. Um, and, you know, they, they use it on, on their own people. They're going to use it on other countries. We can't, we can't afford for any other country like that to, to do that type of stuff. Uh, we can't, we I can't I do that. I understand. But I think that the, the larger issue is how serious neighbors are going to react to any type of military intervention, yeah. you know, whether it be uh, in, in the form of uh, uh, military help or um, any type of production decrease in oil and things like that because there's m uh, multiple ways that, you know, that they can affect um, the United States, maybe not in a military sense as far as here on the home front, but we really need to pay attention and kind of be very calculated um, you know, before we kind of jump into this. I, I don't think any other country is going to intervene saying, hey, we're going to cut off oil production. You're talking about uh, no, oil not production is money to them. Abs They're abs not going to do that. Abs absolutely, but uh, when you position yourself and you, you make an enemy out of Iran or you make an enemy out of these other m Middle Eastern countries, you put yourself at a, you know, at a vulnerable uh, you know, position as, as a nation. Um, you know, things are, all, you know, the relationship already is, you know, on eggshells, so to speak. So. Right, and the saga will continue, so no telling between now and a good night's sleep what's going to happen <laughs> on this. Absolutely. Okay, Ken, you have some other information about a world leader? Absolutely. There is some good news going on uh, in the world, to be sure. Panel, uh, Nelson Mandela, the 95-year-old former president of South Africa and co-founder of the ANC, uh, returned home from the hospital uh, uh, this week. And that is good news because uh, obviously the world's attention has been on Mr. Mandela's health uh, his, as he spent probably the better half, certainly the better half of the summer, but several weeks uh, in, in a hospital in that time. He went in June 8th. June 8th, and at times uh, there had been reporting suggesting that he was gravely ill. So it's good to know that he's uh, gone home. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I start wondering. I said, this man was on the brink of death. I, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they sent him home to die at home. W well, if, if anyone could make a comeback based on his track record, yeah, it would that's be uh, true. Uh, Mr. Mandela. So, well, uh, you know. I hope and so. There's nothing wrong with going home to, to you know, have a, uh, a peaceful sleep with the rest of your family, though. Um, you don't want to, you know, if he's healthy enough to go home, then why not? Well, I'm sure home? they could take the hospital with him. <laughs> you know. Well, let's it continue to pray for Madiba. In yeah. in oh, Africa. I am. I am because yeah. I'm a fan of his. I mean, his bravery, his courage. Remember, you could call into the show today 
313-868-0342, 868-0351, or 868-4336. And uh, we already talked about the Senate approving part of um, the President's plan, but let's go on to the jobless claims. And Robert? Well, jobless claims fell um, um, to 323,000 um, uh, this, this month. Um, they, I think they were estimated to fall from, uh, was it, up to 332,000. Um, but it's, the, it's at its lowest level since 2007 of October, uh, October 2007. So what, are they t what is this telling you, guys? Well, I, I always wonder, frankly, you know, when you hear jobless numbers, uh, unemployment numbers coming out of Washington or coming out of Lansing for the state of Michigan, you always want to jump up and down and say uh, hooray when the numbers, when the jobless numbers, um, when jobs are, are being increased and jobless numbers are down. But you always have to wonder how many people are just checking out of the process. There's a, you know, economists always talk about the structurally unemployed, people who aren't necessarily even seeking employment, who have so, sort of checked out of the traditional or legal <laughs> job market and, and may um, just be gathering resources in some other way. I hope it's great news. It's good to hear, to be sure. Lord knows here in our state, uh, we need good news in terms of people going back to work and people keeping jobs uh, and, uh, and not getting pink slipped and getting sacked. And, and I'm more than guarantee you a good number of, them, uh, of the, the folks. Now, we have to remind ourselves, this is on the, the backside of the year. It's uh, increasing, in increasing towards winter. Uh, Prime, you know, retail sales and things like that. So I'm pretty sure people are picking up um, more and more folks because of that winter season coming on too. And, and, I, th and I think that and along every month it should increase anyway. Yeah, uh, even more toward the holiday yeah. season. And I think that along with Ken's uh, point, you know, it w it would be great if we could somehow surmise the underemployed yeah. because yeah. you know there's a, there's such thing as having a job, but uh, but still being underemployed. And we, we know that. After so many, um, so much time being unemployed, you know, uh, folks will just take what whatever's given to them. And so, you know, while these numbers are great, um, and you know, I'm I'm putting my hands together for them, you know, there's definitely something uh, underneath that you know would uh, behoove us to pay attention to. So maybe we should just give a courtesy clap. All right, yeah. courtesy yeah. clap. Yeah. <laughs> I like so that. First ever, I think. Yeah, I think yeah, the I president's doing a good job yeah. as far as yeah. uh, trying to increase yeah. the number of jobs. Now, you know, if he can get the a jobs bill passed right. with Congress, uh, that'd be even more, um, Absolutely. Even, even greater, actually. So. Absolutely. Detroit is Absolutely. playing a part of that, too, you know, with all, with all the uh, synergy that's going on here. Oh, yeah. yeah, Detroit is uh, the hub right now. Well, Detroit, well, we'll get to Detroit <laughs> later. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about a, co a cowboy. George Zimmerman <laughs> thinks he's a cowboy. He got busted again for speeding. This guy's character. See, you could do a lot of things. You could paint a pig's toenails, but you can't take them out of the mud. Mm. He is what he is, and he he speeds. He's um, He was going, at least this, this police officer gave him a ticket. He was going 60 miles per hour in a 45 mile zone, and he says, well, I guess I was going too fast. And I just think he's always thought he was a cowboy, and he got over like a fat rat in a cheese factory <laughs> when it came to that trial. I know I'm using slogans, no, I know, I but I, it just makes, that's in lieu of other things I want to say. <laughs> also, his wife is divorcing him, and I guarantee you, I guarantee you that eventually she'll probably come out with the real story. You what know, do so you all think? After, this, after the Trayvon incident, it, it does, you know, smell of a notion that, that he do truly believe he's above the law. Um, I mean, at, especially after that first car, you know, uh, the incident with being pulled over, you, you think you learn your lesson. And he wanted the gun back? At yeah. Some, yeah. Right after yeah. The well, you saw he was photographed the other year, uh, the other week, yeah, yeah. Um, with the guy, the manufacturer of the gun he used to kill Trayvon Mark. Yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's indicative of a person's character. Um, you know, that's something that you just don't shake if you feel that you're above the law and uh, we know that a person has a track record and his track record um, isn't good with the law uh, he's he, you know in a few short uh, weeks after the after the uh, verdict you know he's been pulled over numerous times obviously he he uh, he feels that 
those laws don't apply to him. Mm -hmm. And um, under the light that he's in, you think that he would most especially um, uh, be uh, mindful of that. And, uh, you know, he's received some uh, benefits, uh, some uh, some courtesies uh, that you and I wouldn't uh, necessarily benefit from. And, uh, you know, this time I believe you got to take it 60 and a 45. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. One more, what is that, one more mile, and that's reckless driving. So yeah. it, it leads me to think, who, are, who who actually goes 60? So maybe he was going <laughs> yeah. 67, yeah, right. and right. the cop brought it down. You know he was going right? over, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, right. so yeah. this guy, uh, he really is a cowboy. Oh, Georgie. Um, we should maybe change his name to Zoomer Man because he's <laughs> zooming all over the place and breaking laws. I'd so like to go yeah. to a quick break, uh, just a short break uh, for just a moment because I'm trying to get someone to call in on this show when we start talking about stop and frisk. So can we go out and come back in just a moment? Well, we'll be right Thanks again, everybody. Thanks again. That was important. We were going to have a discussion on stop and frisk, and we'd like everybody to join in on that discussion, but I'm going to get a call from an actual New York City police officer so who uh, is going to talk to uh, us about his version of it. Anyway, we're back to the state, and in the state, the judge rejects the Open Meetings Act claims by in Detroit Emergency Manager's lawsuit. And this was a lawsuit brought by Robert Douglas under the um, op Open Meetings Act, Robert D Davis, excuse me. He filed a lawsuit under the Open Meetings Act alleging that State Emergency Loan Board merely rubber stamped the decision that had already been made when it appointed or to the, at the public meeting on March 14. But the ruling issued Tuesday said Davis presents no evidence that the loan board delegated its authority to the governor or treasurer. Well, what do you think? Well, look, I mean, w one thing's for sure. Robert Davis is very, very uh, capable of filing lawsuits. Uh, th look, I, th that's my cynical remark. I, I believe in fair and clean government. Um, you know, I voted, as a lot of people across the state, clearly a majority of people, I voted against the emergency uh, manager uh, referendum last, last fall. Um, I don't believe in emergency managers uh, from a philosophical standpoint. You know, Robert Davis had an opportunity, like every American, to file uh, a suit related to, this, uh, related to this action and how the process for the emergency manager coming to the city. I think it was something that he had the right to do. Uh, the courts have ruled, or there's been a ruling, and I think we move on from that aspect. Now, I don't think any, a lot of us don't like the emergency manager being in town. He is here. What we do have to do, I think, as Detroiters, is, is find a way to get him out as soon as possible, and so I'm all for that. And, and I think that um, basically the framework or the atmosphere has kind of been set for lawsuits like this um, because from a state's perspective, the state was shady on how – they instituted the law. Like, as soon as the po the people voted on it, they turned around. And so yeah, you can't don't. complain about this guy being, um, you know, the way that he is when, you know, the, the groundwork or the atmosphere has already been set for, um, you know, uh, this type of, uh, you know, action. You know, and the thing is, somebody's watching all the time. Yeah, you know, and I think if people wouldn't be too upset if we had a, um, if we had a stronger mayor here. Um, we have, uh, we have mayor. Who is the mayor? If we had a strong mayor, uh, people wouldn't be too upset at Robert Davis for even following these suits, which is his uh, his, his right to, to follow suit um, at any time. But, you know, you have a lot of people that's upset at him um, about him following these suits. It's his right. Yeah. And, and, and if people, you know, I say people need to get out there and vote and write your, uh, 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 to, to put in uh, the right people. Um, a strong mayor. Yeah, but so you know, like people, like Ken said, last, he last voted November. against the uh, emergency manager, and it still got in. I, I think what they did in lame duck was reprehensible. I mean, I, I said it at the time. What the, what the legislature and the governor did uh, in November and December, after the voters 
uh, clearly said uh, collectively that they didn't want this law, I think was reprehensible. Mm -hmm. I think what we do have to do next year, at least I, you know, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not a working journalist anymore, so I can state my position is I, I think we need to vote uh, the, the governor Rick Snyder out as soon as possible. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't wait to start. As uh, soon as the, 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 the November election is over here in the city, I can't wait to start working to make sure that, that Rick Snyder is a one-term governor because he is the reason why the emergency manager is here in the first well, place. Well, some of his people have already started turning against him, yeah. and they're trying to get a Tea Party candidate up. Well, I think people feel powerless uh, because they, they did voice their opinion, and it was muted. And so I think that um, someone like Mr. Davis who uh, – comes and, and even even in a um, even in a maybe hopeless way he kind of gives a voice um, and it, or at least makes makes them uh, slow down you know and address it or hear somebody because obviously they're not listening to the citizens absolutely and he's gonna file enough lawsuits until enough or at least one of them catch and makes a difference <laughs> uh, yeah I well don't think he's gonna stop so uh, well okay let's talk about the 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 election was certified finally. Oh yeah, the state of Michigan's um, um, election panel actually certified Duggan as the primary Detroit's primary uh, winner um, by 20,000 votes. Yeah, 20, um, so instead of uh, um, well, it went from Duggan to um, Napoleon. Um, Benny Napoleon. Now it's back at Duggan um, actually winning that primary. But well, and the thing about it is they found 4,000 more votes. Yeah, yeah. And he was uh, Duggan. Duggan, uh, the state credited him, uh, credited Mike Duggan with four thousand more votes than than uh, originally uh, the <laughs> twenty thousand plus four thousand. So, I mean, it, it, this is I, I wrote the other day on my Facebook page. I mean, I have either worked on campaigns or covered campaigns for the better part of the last twenty two years. I've never ever seen a campaign season like this one. I mean, yeah. nobody could have written it this way. I mean, and it's just September. And, and I, I still don't see how they certified. Uh, 4,000 more, but <laughs> uh, even by 16,000, he would have still um, yeah. been the winner. Well, here's the interesting thing. I mean, you know, we, we, we you talked about the state certifying the, the August primary. However, the Wayne County Board of Canvassers have authorized a recount uh, that was that was uh, asked for, requested by Tom Barrow. So, so on one level, the state has said, okay, we, we are signing off on the primary election, but the Wayne County Board of Canvassers are saying, okay, Mr. Barrow, you have requested a recount, and, and that process uh, uh, was granted uh, this week. So is the primary over? I'm not sure. Well, what <laughs> I want to know is what happened with the Wayne County Canvassers? Didn't they take, they took those votes from, from Duggan? The Wayne County <laughs> and they said they took some votes that were even write-in votes that should have been his. Well, uh, you know, I think our, uh, the term the terminology is important. I mean, yeah. certainly the Duggan people would say they took votes from us. The Napoleon people would say those votes weren't counted because the process was not followed. Remember the hashtag? It's yeah. it, it was, it's the hanging chad of Detroit elections. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the procedure wasn't followed. The Wayne County Board of Canvassers are traditionally argued, followed. followed that is. Tra traditionally yeah. followed because there is there is no really a practice almost, not even a procedure. Um, that wasn't followed. Uh, that wasn't carried out in all of the uh, write-ins, and so uh, the Wayne County Board of Canvassers said there is a there is a a, a segment of the write uh, write-ins that that did not have the hashtag, and therefore we're not going to count them. That was the twenty thousand. Uh, you know, some odd in question. And so it, it's not like the, it's not like people didn't write Michael Duggan or Mike Duggan. What the Wayne County Board of Canvassers said is we're not going to count those signatures because it didn't have the hashtag uh, as the process in Wayne County and, and apparently and called for. They also said they weren't going to count them and they weren't going to certify they them. So yeah, they passed yeah, right. the buck on to, to the, the state, state to actually count and certify uh, those votes. And if you're scoring at home, folks, that's four, three, two, double play. No, I mean, it, 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 I mean I, you know, I, I've worked in politics most of my life, and it's very, very confusing to follow all this. You know, again, I ask the question, is the, is the primary over or not? And meanwhile, we've got the general election coming up in November. And, you know, in as two I two months. In, yeah, in two months. And as I've said on this program, you know, I, as we all want to see, I, I'd, I'd love to get to the point where we're talking about issues and not lawsuits. 
and, and not boards of canvassers and not state intervention and not federal intervention, just talking about what's your plan to make Detroit better? You know what, a good friend of mine uh, makes me think of a quote that she says um, all the time. She says, business takes a second. The bull crap take all day. Mm -hmm. and so right, right now, I think that uh, you know we're in the middle of uh, one of two of those yeah, right scenarios. And, uh, yeah, is that patent? So yeah, I want to use that the next <laughs> book. I I don't know what's going on. I don't. What What do you think? Three one three eight six eight zero three four two. And to in keeping of what we were talking about, <laughs> <it> Mr. <laughs> Barrow had he pressed for a recount as we said, and they had a meeting yesterday about it. But he also pressed for Quicken Loans, who gave Mike Duggan $80 million. Uh, oh, no, 80,000. No, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, oh, God. Oh. He's getting a lot of money, but not that much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. $80,000 that they had to take it back. Could someone talk about that? Ken, is yeah. that you? Well, uh, you might remember th there's state law that prohibits casino investors from uh, making contributions, uh, campaign contributions to and political it campaigns. And it should yeah, be. As it should be. I don't think that anybody would disagree with that. You might remember uh, 15, uh, maybe 15 years ago, um, there was a well-connected um, uh, uh, MGM investor, uh, Bill Picard, a close friend of Dennis Archer, had, who had made a political contribution, and there was a big hubbubble over whether or not he had to give it back. Um, essentially, that well, not essentially, that is state law. And so the argument here um, that Mr. Barrow advances is Quicken Loans, the founder uh, of Quicken Loans is obviously Dan Gilbert. And so if Quicken Loans, their, their political arm, makes a contribution, the argument goes, well, of course it is Dan Gilbert giving the money, who is now a casino, a casino owner in the state of Michigan. That is what the argument is. The quick and loan people say, well, no, it wasn't Dan Gilbert that gave the money personally, not Dan himself, but it was his employees. And so what's going to have to be hashed out is whether or not legally, you know, uh, you know what is, wh what, how, does, how, how is this interpreted? Is it, is it Dan Gilbert, who ultimately is the owner of, of quick and loans, or, it, or can the employees as a group, separate from Dan Gilbert, give the money? You know, what I, what I do like about this, um, I like these type of suits mm -hmm. uh, because if, if Barrow wasn't there or your Davises, um, we wouldn't find out about this type of stuff. I, 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 I certainly didn't know a casino owner could not contribute oh, to a, uh, right. a, uh, a candidate. Um, but this brings out information. He, and it, the only reason why he gave it back is because of the suit. Absolutely. That yeah, $80,000 to the back. Yeah. Um, he would never gave that back to him had the suit not come about, um, had his information had not come out there about who's donating money to what campaign. Well, it, it, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, I didn't want to step on you. Go, go right ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I think that, you know, it's, it's just a matter of being uh, sticking to uh, the letter of the law. And it, it, it clearly states that uh, the person or a legal entity um, cannot, um, you know, contribute. And so I, I, I think that, you know, anyone with um, any type of uh, reasonable sense um, will know that Quicken Loans is a legal entity that represents Mr. Gilbert. And so, um, you know, I, I'm right with you, uh, Rob, when you say that these type of issues, it, it's great that Barrow or Davis bring these out because, you know, they're not going to, you know, um, Quicken Loans or, or, or uh, Dan Gilbert, they're de surely not going to mention it, or, or even the uh, the Duggan um, campaign. They're not going to mention it either. Well, it, it raises, I mean, it, you know, the, the campaign contributions by casino owners has really been sort of well documented in the previous campaigns. But the, but the, but the fact remains, if, 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 if nothing else for good PR reasons, it, it would probably be the best, it, it was the best thing for, uh, for the Quicken Loans folks to take the money back, for the Duggan people to give the money back. Uh, Lord knows Mike Duggan seems to be raking in and all the dough. I'm sure the 80 grand is not going to, it's not worth the bad publicity yeah. and the bad politics that will come out of that um, if they were to fight or, you know, have some, have some issue about, about giving it back. Uh, it's probably the best thing to do. And I think in a lot of cases, guys, um, and Brenda, I think if, you know, if you're in doubt, you know, go the extra mile to, to take away any appearance. And yeah, that, so yeah, I think it was the yeah. right thing to do. At least until you settle an issue. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the best thing mm -hmm. to do. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Like you say, the money isn't, I don't think that money hurt him. But I'm wondering about Mr. Napoleon's campaign and the, are they getting any money? 
but uh, we're going to uh, talk about the certainly demolition. Not from downtown Detroit. <laughs> What'd you say? I said certainly not from downtown Detroit. It's not their go-to land. All right. Well, maybe not. Well, the Brewster Douglas projects are being torn down. They said it'll take quite a while. Those were some big projects. Mm -hmm. Ken, you had something to talk about on that historically too. Yeah, I think you know it's uh, as a lifelong Detroiter, it it, it, it certainly gives me. Um, sort of a bittersweet um, disposition. I mean, obviously, um, the Brewster Douglas uh, towers, the Douglas portion of the towers, uh, or the towers themselves, the Brewster Douglas apartments, um, you know, haven't been occupied for many, many years. And so, I mean, obviously, it's been an eyesore, but it, but, but it had great history. I mean, when, when, when the Brewster portion of the complex was built in 1935, uh, they had a great uh, street pageant to, to, to celebrate in Black Bottom that the housing was coming. It was at a time when African Americans were really families, two and three families were living in the same one and two room dwellings because there was a lot of overcrowding here. People, uh, African Americans were coming here from the South uh, and it was the federal government and the city of Detroit's way to sort of relieve some of the overcrowding. So Brewster Douglas was built. But on that day when the uh, groundbreaking was held, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt uh, was here in wow. Black Bottom to really? celebrate, mm -hmm. uh, to turn the shovel um, with the city leaders. And so I, it's bittersweet. I think that the towers had to come down to be sure for progress. Um, but I think that we should always remember, and you know, that's sort of my thought about what's going on this week, um, you know, down in, 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 in Black, an old Black Bottom. And, and I think that, it, you know, uh, with the bittersweet, uh, maybe there's an opportunity for some type of landmark to uh, always commemorate what was there in the significance. Um, but Smokey I Robinson used to live there, yeah, Diana yeah, Ross, Lily yeah. Tomlin. But it's, it's time, it's time. Oh, for no, for I, definitely I, time I certainly don't want to block the progress on this. Well, I just think we ought to remember. And quite frankly, no one's going to buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, no one's occupied the building. No one really wanted it. So, I mean, if you, you come in off 75 um, and you see three, was it three huge towers Six, it was six at one no time. Windows. No windows. I mean, it, it, you have to do something with it, and it's occupying some prime real estate down there. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's really prime yeah. now. It's really prime. Oh, there's going to be some, uh, what, I don't know what's going there, there's, but there's whatever there's it is, it's going to be nice. It's going to be nice. Yeah. yeah, I wrote a story <laughs> once, and that was my centerpiece for it. But you know, the good news, just as a quick, because I know we got to move, the, the good news is uh, Chris was talking about something to commemorate the history. The city has done a good job over the years. When the, when the Brewster portion was tore down about 20 years ago, Dennis Archer and city council did build uh, new, new affordable housing there, and it holds right the Brewster name. Uh, the Senior Citizens Complex, which is right across the street, holds the Paradise Valley name. So I, 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 I hear you, and I think you raise a great point. I think the city has done a good job of making sure that um, that they preserve the history so that people will know what was there. Absolutely. Well, we're going to move on. I, we had some other things, but I looked at the time. You know the time escapes us all the time. And I want to talk about an article or a column you wrote on stop and frisk, mm -hmm. Ken, uh, and it's titled, Stop and Frisk is Wrong for Detroit. Would you tell us a little bit about what you were talking about and we mm. could discuss it? I appreciate it. Uh, about two weeks ago, well, first of all, let me step back. The city of New York, uh, really for several years now, has operated a policing policy which is generally known as stop and frisk. And uh, Would you tell the, the audience and exactly and what that is? Absolutely. Stop and frisk is, is, a, is a policing strategy, at least in terms of what th they're doing in New York. Uh, they believe that it has been uh, very much uh, helpful to them in reducing the crime rate. Stop and frisk is essentially just what it is. Um, the law enforcement officials, um, uh, through st uh, statistics and arrest records and, 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 and the like, figure out a zone uh, of, of a city or a community. Maybe it's a block. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a three or four blocks. But they really sort of triage the area with police, with, with law enforcement officials, and anybody that is under suspicion as they see it is, is stopped and frisked. I mean, you can be literally walking down the street, and that might be considered to be a high, uh, you know, a high drug zone or a crime zone. And anybody that sort of fits the reasonable um, suspicion analysis that one makes in their head <laughs> can be stopped, patted down, frisked. Where are you going? Where's your ID? Uh, what is your name? And so uh, uh, 
community, uh, there was a community in New York, uh, including some officers, thought this, thought this was a terrible policy for the city of New York. They sued the city of New York. Uh, and what happened about three weeks ago, a federal judge sided with the class action plaintiffs saying, um, you know, stop and there are some um, constitutional issues or concerns around stop and frisk. And the judge, the federal judge, placed a monitor um, over the program and over the department to, to monitor, um, you know, on a, on a regular basis, the statistics coming out of the policing approach. And so when the federal judge handed that ruling down a couple weeks ago, I was approached by the Detroit News um, uh, and asked my position on stop and frisk. Okay. I said I had a problem with it, and so yeah. I wrote a piece. Uh, we must say, too, that Mayor Bloomberg mm. was against this, uh, the courts for that. Oh, you know, the, the, no, I, I thought it was clear. The, the mayor and the police yeah, chief. Ray Kelly. Yeah, the, play, the, play, uh, the mayor and the police chief, Ray Kelly, uh, have, have lauded stop and frisk. I mean, the reason why it is continuing to go is because the mayor and the police chief wanted to. In fact, um, you know, they've been very adamant about that. And so uh, the Detroit News said, well, you know, what's your p position on it? Would you be interested in writing a, a, a guest column? Uh, and so that is how the column um, was published uh, in the Detroit News itself uh, a couple weeks ago. And you had some very good points on it and everything. Uh, you talked about New York, and then you wanted to get back to the Motor City, and you talked about the police force in the Motor City and the percentage of police to people and ethnically. Yeah. My concern is really twofold. One, um, you know, I'm, I'm always interested in the history, and in the, in the history of stop and frisk type strategies in Detroit um, have names and, and, and phrases that Stress, we're all, yes. Mm -hmm. The big four. Absolutely, that we're very well familiar with. And so those are, in effect, stop and frisk type policies. Wait. And so I wanted to remind the readers that there was a history there. Um, the big four. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many of you out there remember the big four. Mm -hmm. I do. I don't think Robert or Chris no. knew. And I don't, I'm surprised you can uh, yeah, knew what the big, big <laughs> four, uh, the big four was. And that was actually four police detectives in a car. Because once district. back in the late 60s, yeah. uh, they actually came to my house. Well, I lived in an upper flat over at Dennis' office, and I called the police because someone was breaking in downstairs. And the big four came. They all jumped out of the car at the same time. They all had these long overcoats. They were <laughs> they were just threatening looking. Serious well, dude. Well, <laughs> I, th I think that the I think that there are some, um, some some good things that can come from a policy like this. I think that it should be uh, maybe termed profile stop and frisk first. <laughs> but <laughs> as someone who has been uh, stopped under the guise of something like this, um, I can say that at the time, I, you know, I was in um, a, a tough area in Detroit, and um, the officers thought I shouldn't be there for s whatever reason, and they pulled me over, pulled me out of the car, and and frisked me, and I, I, I was highly upset, and I didn't understand why. I, I've never had any uh, type of um, a situation with the law or anything like that. And, uh, you know, I, th I think that we have to kind of start to, um, you know, uh, I guess uh, figure out is, is it all about the ends or is, is it does it does it even matter, you know, the means to the end? Let so me, uh, right, right. And, Ken, I'm sorry I, I interrupted you no, 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 about no. the uh, – but you were talking about the ethnic group, but I wanted to just say how threatening looking the big four seemed. That, mm -hmm. I'll never forget that image. And they all jumped out the car at the same time. It was like a TV show. And, and things like this can start, I mean, yeah, we have to, I, I visualize a lot of things. Can you imagine, uh, you know, how this may appear in tough neighborhoods in the city of Detroit? Mm -hmm. Maybe you got a couple of white officers and they're stopping a gang, a, a young, you know. Intimidate. And so how could that affect, the, you know, in the community? How could it incite something, you know? Um, and so we have to, I think all of those dynamics need to be considered um, before we rally behind or rally against, uh, you know. Hey, we didn't have, um, in, in our era, I guess, we didn't have a big four, but we had gang squad. Yeah, some people uh, say the gang squad was just <laughs> another <laughs> manifestation of yeah, it. I've talked to people since. Will, yeah. I mean, it would get out the, the, the car and destroy you. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's what they were known for, especially coming from uh, Northwestern High School. They were there yeah. um, and ready for, you know, something to happen, number one, or they will, you know, uh, uh, go well, in and I intervene before something happens. Don't yeah. you think their presence was threatening enough? Ken, let's go back to the um, statistics. Mm -hmm. I, we'll keep on going away, and I. Okay. I'm sorry. 
You were talking about well, 63. Well, it, yes, um, and these are 2000 statistics. And so, you know, one could make the argument that the, it, it might be a, a might not be the best set of numbers as the numbers that the police department provided for me. But in 2000, 63% um, of the, uh, the, the police force um, were African Americans. And, and, and certainly in 2000, the percentage of African Americans in the city was certainly a lot higher than that, um, 80 or 85%. The point that I was making with that, Brenda, is you know what the city looks like today, the city may not look like tomorrow. We clearly know while we look, to, while we look at Detroit as a chocolate city, it, it very much is a black city to be sure, but there are pockets of other communities, um, ethnic groups and racial groups within Absolutely. it. We have a sizable Absolutely. Latino community in Southwest Detroit, a Bangladeshi community in Northeast Detroit. And so what, what I tried to do in the piece was look at it from the standpoint of, you know, it's, it's bigger than just, you know, black on black crime, although that's huge. I mean, look, I, I'm 45 years old, never been arrested, never been in the backseat of a car, of a, a squad car. But there are a lot of brothers that I grew up with who have. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest about that. But we have to weigh, in my view, the civil liberty portion of it to the, the you know, the, 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 the perception of, of, of safety. And so I just weigh more heavily on civil liberties. I think that unless you, you can explain to me why you arrest, why, you, why, why you're stopping me, um, tell me why I had reasonable suspicion. Uh, it's not good enough for me to just say, hey, this is a high traffic area and you fit the profile. That's not good enough for me, and it shouldn't be good enough for anybody. And, and, and with policies like this, there's always going to be, there always needs to be foresight. Um, what will be the next layer to this, you know? Mm -hmm. And because, you know, stop and frisk is, would be something new now, or not new, but kind of recycled now, or when it's been implemented for a while, what will be the next stop, frisk, detain? Mm -hmm. you well, know? we have a caller on the line, Fitzpatrick. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm just, I just wanted to say, uh, we always have these shows, but we never talk about the significance of a father in the family, and these youth wouldn't be out there, and we never talk about the trade schools, and they wouldn't be out there. Give them an option. The youth have nothing to do in Detroit. It's all for the grown people in downtown and midtown. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. And that, of course, is one of the uh, reasons that a lot of young kids are on the streets because there is nothing to do. And he brought up an excellent, excellent point there. And because nobody wants their son to be stopped and frisked. Not even, not even just your son to be stopped and frisked. Or your I, son. I can, I can envision me walking with my five-year-old. Uh, you know, we live in walking distance to his kindergarten. I could be walking down St. Albans to pick him up or to take him to school, and under the, you know, under the stop and frisk scenario, uh, uh, you know, a squad car swoons down on me and my five-year-old, uh, where are you going, <laughs> you know, yeah. shake me down, and imagine the five-year-old looking up and saying all that. I mean, we, you have to look at this in its totality. I think you guys have heard me on this show for weeks. I'm a, you know, Law and order is, I think we all aspire to, you know, to have a, a safe city. I just think there are limits for me. I mean, I, I grew up, um, you know, my mom was part of the community organization that, 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 that fought stress, the police decoy program, the stop and frisk program in the 70s. And so I was a five-year-old watching my mom organize with Kenny Cockrell and Sheila Cockrell and these guys. And so I, I'm more passionate about it, maybe more than uh, maybe more than others. But no, I, I, I just think there's a limit to what well, we need I to do. Well, I agree with that. But you know, a lot of community people are calling for something because sure. they feel like the inmates have taken over the asylum. Sure. And like Fitzpatrick was saying too, a lot of it, em well, a lot of what the ha is happening with the kids too emanates from what's going on in the home and fathers not not being like you can. Sure. And, and uh, I think that. Uh, the policy, while it may have some benefits or some drawbacks, we need to look at more of training of the force. Because if you just implement a policy and you haven't um, introduced them, you know, maybe to culture or, or the social immers immersion of different cultures outside of what you're Absolutely. accustomed to, then you're going to have individuals who are just uh, in a uh, in a haphazard way stopping and frisking. Because just because you got braids doesn't mean that you sell drugs. And I think that from from a from a preventative or from a proactive standpoint versus policy, we need to start looking more at training. How can we um, better equip our yeah better yeah. equip our police force to actually be able to navigate and uh, dis discern 
you know, individuals, whether they be on the left or the right side of the law. Mm -hmm. So what do you say, Ken? Uh, well, what should we have? I, I'm all for, look, I, you know, I'm all for the approach that, that various police chiefs over the last 25 or 30 years have tried to, imp tried to implement. Community policing strategies. I mean, it is very, you know, one of the, and, and this is something that's out of the hands, quite frankly, of the Detroit police and even whoever the next mayor will be, but when we talked about this in previous shows, one of the reasons why I really think stop and frisk is a bad idea is now uh, sworn police officers can live up to 45 miles away from the city where they yeah. serve. Yeah. I mean, how are you going to live in Sumter, Sumter Township mm -hmm. or going to live at almost to Ann Arbor and police a community. I write in the piece about both, uh, about um, Ben Turbin, um, the legendary African-American police officer right. of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Well, uh, there weren't very many police officers in, in the 1930s and 40s, but the p police department put Ben Turbin in the black community, in Black Bottom. So when Ben was cracking heads, at least he lived in that neighborhood, and he knew Pookie was no good, <laughs> and Pookie's mama knew he was no good, right, and right. she didn't have a problem with Ben, you know, wrapping him across the head. I mean, I, I'm a little, you know, I'm a little animated and facetious yeah. about that, but the point is, to Chris's point, community policing yeah, is yeah. still a good strategy, yeah. Brenda, and, and while police departments have talked around it at times, it has never really been implemented. And some of it is out of their hands, like I said, with the residency law, but I have no problem with aggressive policies if I know who, where the police officers are and they have some stake in my community. Absolutely. Now they don't. And even with uh, the, the, the residency issue, I would like to see some type of policy pre-hiring. Pre uh, maybe if you, want, if you want to become a Detroit police officer, you come down and do so many uh, hours of community service in the community um, to get extra points toward being an officer. That way you're introduced before you got the gun, before you got the badge, and you meet these folks on an even playing field. That's not bad. Yeah, uh, you know, back to the Ben Turbin, Turbin example. I mean, he oh, actually was a baseball, he had baseball leagues for kids. So he's around. We have uh, my nephew, Warwick. Warwick, hello? Yes, sir. Yes, um, he's on the line. He's a New York City police officer, and I have three gentlemen here. I have Robert, I have Chris, and I have Ken. And we're discussing stop and frisk because they were talking about having something similar here in Detroit. Um, okay. Could you tell us, since you are a member of the New York Police Department, exactly what stop and frisk is? Well, stop question re really is called stop question and frisk. What it is basically is uh, we try to target known crime locations like drug areas or you know grand larceny areas, and you know we target the people that you know hang out in those areas for more any from anywhere from 10 to 15, 20 minutes without just, just doing anything, sitting there, standing there, or whatever. So when you're in a place like that, when you're in a drug, a drug area like that, what you do is if you, we see you there in more than 15, 20 minutes, then we'll come up to you, we get your name, your address, you know, what you're doing here, how long you've been there, and what, you, what you're doing there, and then we'll send you on your way. That's basically what stuff question the first is in New York. Well, couldn't they be just standing around talking? Yeah, if they, if, you know, sitting there talking, but I mean, you can sit there, if you're in a group, of, if you're in a group, a couple of people talking, that's one thing, but if you're just standing there, for example, you're in, a, uh, in the subway system, basically where, where we targeted at, if you're waiting on a train in a particular station, and you know you're waiting on the train for more than 15, 20 minutes, and you four or five trains that went by, then that's what we do, we do that also, because you're not, you're not just waiting on the train, it's a train that went by five, six times, and you're still there, so basically you're loitering. So it's either two things. You're waiting to buy drugs, you're waiting to sell drugs, or you're waiting to commit another crime. Wow. Any questions, guys? I, I respect, the, the, uh, I respect uh, law enforcement. I respect the, that you have to have the ability to do your job. But just, just the last point that you made, I, I don't see why there can't be a third or fourth option. I just wanted to stand there because I was standing there. I was reading my email. I was doing anything for 15 or 20 minutes. I, I, know what, I know what the numbers will probably bear out, and I wouldn't well, argue with those. It well, still well, it it basically, it all, depends on the, it all depends on the officer. Sure, and, and that's another problem. Here's the analogy of it. Especially if you've got a lot of, of black officers, a lot of black officers or you know, Latino officers in a, uh, you know, a, you know, a area, what's going to happen is we're going to do the same thing. But basically, if you've got a lot of white officers in black locations, black areas, they're going to do the same thing as well. Because, number one, if you're just standing there, and like I said, if you're looking at your phone and you're checking your email, that's one thing. But if you're reading a newspaper or something like that, maybe you just, that's not. But if you're not doing, if you're just standing there, just doing nothing, then that's to give me reason, make reasonable, reasonable suspicion to question why you stand. 
for so long. Mm-hmm. You, I would, I would uh, venture to ask, have you uh, personally or anyone uh, who you know personally um, been a um, target of the stop and frisk? Um, uh, and how did you feel about it, or how did they feel about it um, once uh, once they kind of talked to you about it? Well, what happened is, well, I don't know anyone that's just been a target, you know, because, you know, depending on the situation, anybody could be a target. I mean, I've, I've actually got pulled over myself mm-hmm. to the side because, of the, maybe because I'm tall, I'm maybe African-American, I have you dreadlocks. Have dreadlocks. Maybe I might just be passing through an area that might be a, a prone <laughs> crime location. And they, once I show my identification, then it's, it's all, all, all hands off after that. Yeah. But how did you feel? Yeah. Everybody don't have uh, well, it all depends. You know, because like I said, I'm driving a nice car, you know, and this is what basically they're targeting. You know, guys are driving a nice fancy car. I'm not saying they can't have nice cars without selling drugs or doing anything like illegal. But um, I felt a little violated, you know. But then I, being on the other side, I know where they're coming from, too, because the basic thing is, listen, I want to know why you're here. You know, because I don't, I, if I don't, I want to know why you're here. I don't trust you. I, uh, if you're here long I mean, just because you're driving a nice car? No, no, not just because you're driving a nice car. That's not it. Because I got a nice car, and like I said, if I'm driving a nice car, and I'm in, and like I said, I don't frequent areas, but if I just happen to pass through an area like that, I might get pulled over because I have dark tinted windows. I mean, oh. I pull, I pull, I pull Asian people over because they have dark tinted windows. They it's have what? Dark tinted windows. Oh, dark tinted windows. Window. Wow. Well, Warwick, we, uh, the show is about to come to an end, and i got to wrap it up. And I'm so happy that uh, you, you called us. I wish we could have talked about this longer. So maybe uh, we'll get a chance for you to call another time. Uh, call me this weekend. All right, Antia. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. That's great. Bye-bye. Yeah. But to close out, um, two things that come Quickly, in, cause come, cause come in mind is uh, the impact on this on our, our young women in the community as well. Mm-hmm. I think we, we are naturally prone to think about young men, um, but also there's going to be an effect as far as you yeah. know how young women will be stopped and first. There needs to be some type of um, precursor to this. This can't just be dropped on, on the force mm-hmm. um, that uh, has had inconsistent leadership for the last, I was talking to a friend of mine, he's been on the force, I think, like five years, and he maybe had, had six police chiefs or something. I like know, that. I know. Well, the saga continues, everybody, and I'll have the men back next week. Gentlemen, thank you. Yeah. This has been a great conversation, and we will see you next week right here on Table Talk with Brenda Perryman at Let's 1 p.m. Let's bring the issues to the table on Table Talk with Brenda Perryman. Table Talk is Detroit's